Ancient Egypt, the land of pharaohs, pyramids, and one of humanity's greatest civilizations. But there's a fierce debate raging about who can actually claim this incredible legacy. On one side, you have people arguing that modern Egyptians are essentially the same people as the ancient pyramid builders. On the other side, there are those who claim that modern Egyptians have little to no connection to ancient Egypt, and that the real descendants are sub-Saharan African groups like Nubians, Kenyans, and other African peoples. Both sides are passionate, both sides have their theories, and both sides… well, let's just say the actual DNA evidence is going to surprise everyone. Today, we're diving deep into ancient Egyptian genetics, and we're going to work backwards through time, from modern Egypt all the way back to the Old Kingdom, when the pyramids were actually being built. And trust me, the revelations from a 4,000-year-old DNA sample are going to blow your mind. Let's start with what we know about modern Egyptians genetically. This is important because it sets the stage for everything we're about to discover. Modern Egyptians show a complex genetic profile that includes North African, Middle Eastern, and yes, Sub-Saharan African ancestry. But here's where it gets interesting. Contrary to what many people assume, the Sub-Saharan African component in Egyptian DNA has actually increased over time, not decreased. A major 2017 study published in Nature Journal analyzed this phenomenon and found something fascinating. The researchers looked at genetic changes in Egyptian populations over the past 1,500 years and discovered that sub-Saharan African admixture in that time frame increased, not decreased. There was a minor increase during post-Roman times, but the really significant jump happened during the Islamic period of Egyptian history. This makes sense when you think about it. The Islamic conquest opened up new trade routes, brought new populations, and created connections between Egypt and Sub-Saharan Africa that hadn't existed before. During the Islamic period, starting around 640 CE, Egypt became part of a vast Islamic empire that connected North Africa, the Middle East, and eventually Sub-Saharan Africa through trade and cultural exchange. The genetic evidence shows that this period brought new populations into Egypt, including people from further south in Africa. This wasn't a massive population replacement, we're talking about gradual gene flow over centuries, but it was significant enough to alter the genetic landscape. The trans-Saharan trade routes became incredibly important during this time. Merchants, scholars, soldiers, and slaves moved along these routes, and some settled in Egypt permanently. The Islamic Empire's expansion into places like Sudan, Ethiopia, and even deeper into Africa created migration patterns that hadn't existed during earlier periods. Arab conquests also brought some Middle Eastern ancestry, but interestingly, this contribution was relatively minor compared to what we'll see when we go further back in time. The Islamic genetic impact was more about connecting Egypt to Sub-Saharan Africa than flooding it with Arabian Peninsula ancestry. So if you're wondering why modern Egyptians show Sub-Saharan African ancestry, part of the answer is that this component has been growing more prominent over the centuries, not disappearing. This completely contradicts the narrative that ancient Egyptians were wiped away from their Sub-Saharan African admixture. But this raises an obvious question. If modern Egyptians have been gaining Sub-Saharan African ancestry over time, what did ancient Egyptians actually look like genetically? Well, it all depends on how far back you go. Now let's go back further, to the time when Egypt was ruled by the Ptolemies, descendants of Alexander the Great's General Ptolemy, and later when Egypt became a Roman province. You might expect that Greek and Roman rule would have dramatically changed Egyptian genetics. After all, these were major imperial powers that controlled Egypt for centuries. The Ptolemaic period lasted for nearly 300 years, and Roman control lasted even longer. But here's the surprising thing. The genetic impact of Greek and Roman rule was actually quite limited. Yes, there was some gene flow from the Mediterranean world, but it wasn't the major transformative event you might expect. The Ptolemies famously intermarried within their own family to keep the bloodline pure. Cleopatra VII, the most famous Ptolemaic ruler, was actually more inbred than the average Egyptian of her time. While there was certainly some mixing between Greek settlers and local Egyptians, particularly in Alexandria and other major cities. It didn't fundamentally alter the genetic structure of the Egyptian population. The Romans brought administrative efficiency, architectural innovations, and cultural influence, but again, the genetic impact was relatively modest. Roman Egypt was primarily an agricultural province that supplied grain to Rome, 
Most Romans who came to Egypt were administrators, soldiers, or merchants who eventually returned to other parts of the empire. What's particularly interesting is that both Greek and Roman rule were largely urban phenomena. The vast majority of Egyptians continued living in rural areas along the Nile, maintaining their traditional way of life and, apparently, their genetic profile. So, if it wasn't the Greeks or Romans who significantly changed Egyptian genetics, what was the major transformative event? Here's where our story takes a dramatic turn. The event that most significantly altered Egyptian genetics wasn't the famous conquests everyone talks about. It wasn't Alexander, it wasn't the Romans, it wasn't even the Arabs. It was the Hyksos invasion during the Second Intermediate Period, around 1650 to 1550 BCE. The Hyksos were Semitic-speaking peoples from the Levant, modern-day Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. They didn't just raid Egypt, they conquered and ruled northern Egypt for over a century. This was one of the most traumatic periods in ancient Egyptian history, so much so that Egyptians would refer to it as the time when Egypt was ruled by foreign kings. But what made the Hyksos invasion so genetically significant wasn't just the conquest itself, it was the scale of population movement that came with it. Unlike later conquests that were primarily political and military affairs, the Hyksos period involved substantial migration of entire populations from the Levant into Egypt. And here's the genetic bombshell. DNA studies from the Third Intermediate Period show that the Hyksos invasion introduced substantial new ancestry into Egypt. We're talking about Iranian Neolithic farmer ancestry, Caucasus hunter-gatherer admixture, and increased Anatolian farmer ancestry. This wasn't just a political conquest. It was a demographic event that fundamentally changed the genetic landscape of Egypt. The Hyksos mixed with the existing Egyptian population and created a new genetic profile that would persist for millennia. Now so much as immediately showed these events that the same challenges that has start taking with Nomini involves. When we look at samples from the Third Intermediate Period, we clearly see this West Asian admixture that wasn't present in earlier periods. The genetic signature is unmistakable. These populations brought ancestry components that can be traced back to the ancient Near East, the Iranian Plateau, and the Caucasus Mountains. What's remarkable is that this Bronze Age genetic shift was so profound that it overshadowed all the later, more famous conquests. The Hyksos period created the basic genetic template that would define Egyptian populations for the next 3,000 years. This is the major genetic discontinuity in Egyptian history. Not the later, more famous conquests, but this Bronze Age event that most people have never heard of. It shows us that sometimes the most important historical events aren't the ones that make it into popular consciousness. The Hyksos eventually were expelled by native Egyptian rulers who founded the New Kingdom, but their genetic legacy remained. The populations that had mixed during the Hyksos period didn't disappear. They became part of the Egyptian genetic landscape permanently. And now, for the moment you've been waiting for. Let's go back to the very beginning, to the Old Kingdom period, when the pyramids were being built, when Egypt was at its most iconic. In 2023, Morez and colleagues published groundbreaking research on sample NUE001, DNA extracted from an Old Kingdom Egyptian found in Nurat dating to around 2400 BCE. This is one of the oldest Egyptian DNA samples ever successfully analyzed, and it gives us a direct window into the genetics of the pyramid builders. What they found was absolutely remarkable and changes everything we thought we knew about ancient Egyptian genetics. First, the paternal Y DNA lineage of this ancient Egyptian is consistent with modern Egyptians, so there is genuine genetic continuity. The patrilineal descendants of this old kingdom individual are still living in Egypt today. This is profound because it means that despite all the conquests, migrations, and population changes over 4,400 years, some Egyptian family lines have persisted in the same region. But here's where it gets fascinating. This ancient Egyptian was genetically unlike any modern population on Earth. The NUE001 sample was approximately 90% Natufian-related ancestry and 10% Northeast African hunter-gatherer ancestry, similar to the Moda sample from Ethiopia. This is a genetic profile that simply doesn't exist in substantial numbers anywhere in the modern world. To put this in perspective, the closest modern equivalent would be someone who's about 80% Yemeni and 20% Afar, but even that's not a perfect match. We're talking about a genetic profile that has essentially vanished from the earth in terms of sub-Saharan African ancestry. Because Natufians themselves had some Moda-like affinity, the overall proportions of this sample are three quarters West Eurasian and one quarter sub-Saharan African. This makes this sample noticeably more African than Bronze Age Egyptians, but only slightly more African than modern Egyptians. 
This ancient Egyptian had no Anatolian farmer ancestry, no Iranian Neolithic ancestry, no Caucasus hunter-gatherer ancestry, and no West African ancestry. These are all components that modern Egyptians have thanks to later migrations and conquests, particularly that Bronze Age Hyksos event we discussed. The Natufian component is particularly interesting because the Natufians were ancient hunter-gatherers who lived in the Levant and are considered ancestral to many Middle Eastern populations. They were among the world's first sedentary hunter-gatherers and played a crucial role in the development of agriculture. The Northeast African hunter-gatherer component, similar to the Moda sample from Ethiopia, represents the indigenous African ancestry that was present in Northeastern Africa before the major population movements of later periods. What this tells us is that the pyramid builders were essentially a mix of ancient Middle Eastern hunter-gatherers and indigenous northeastern African populations, a combination that no longer exists in its original proportions anywhere in the world. So what does this tell us about ancient Egyptian identity and who can claim their legacy? First, let's address the elephant in the room. This old kingdom Egyptian was roughly three quarters West Eurasian and one quarter Sub-Saharan African. Whether you consider that black or not is honestly up to you and your personal definitions. What's clear is that ancient Egyptians were neither identical identical to modern Egyptians, nor were they purely sub-Saharan African. They were their own unique population with their own distinct genetic profile. Second, Nubians, who often get brought up in these discussions, were indeed a neighboring civilization with their own rich history and culture. The Kingdom of Kush, centered in modern-day Sudan, was a powerful force that even conquered Egypt during the 25th dynasty. But they were genetically and culturally distinct from ancient Egyptians. The NUE-001 sample doesn't cluster with ancient Nubian samples. It represents a different population entirely. This is important because it shows that northeastern Africa wasn't genetically homogeneous. Different regions had different populations with different ancestries, even if they shared some common elements. Third, modern Egyptians do have genuine genetic continuity with ancient Egyptians. That Y-DNA lineage proves it, but they also have substantial additional ancestry from the Hyksos period, the Islamic period, and other historical historical events. Here's what the genetic evidence actually tells us. The Egyptians who built the pyramids likely looked somewhat different from modern Egyptians, but they are their ancestors nonetheless. That old kingdom individual was about one quarter sub-Saharan African, so whether you want to call the pyramid builders black is really up to your personal interpretation.